Hi, there are lots of new and exciting treatments for epilepsy. And in this year, there are this is the forefront of epilepsy and there are lots of new and exciting treatments that we will go over. And based on the recent uh, advancement in, in epilepsy treatment, uh, coming directly from the American Epilepsy Society conference and all the new updates in epilepsy and treatment. And if you have any questions, please ask them down in the comment and I will be uh, answering them in this program. As well. The definition of epilepsy is that when there are spontaneous seizures that happens without any obvious trigger, and then usually the seizures happen more than 24 hours, like two seizures more than 24 hours, that will be the diagnosis of epilepsy and seizures. And then this is a diagnosis and we can do testing to prove that this is an epilepsy. And then we should differentiate between what type of epilepsy, is it focal epilepsy or generalized epilepsy? We can do that by examining the patient, taking good history and reviewing the uh, EEG and brain MRI to put all of that together to make the final diagnosis about epilepsy. We will start treatment for the patients with epilepsy and then the best treatment is the first treatment. Usually medications work very well and the first medication is successful in about 50 to 70 percent of the time which is a great success. So 50 to 70 percent of people with uh, epilepsy their seizures will stop completely once they start their medications and that is a great achievement. And uh, unfortunately, about a third of the patient, 25 to 30 percent, seizures will not respond to medications. And this is called drug resistant epilepsy and refractory epilepsy. And this is the new, uh, this is the type of epilepsy that has all the new treatments and advancements because we need treatments for the new, uh, new treatments for this type of epilepsy that does not respond to medications. The first thing that we do with treatment is uh, having. Uh, the first thing we do uh, with with treatment is is having the uh, medication uh, uh, the, the medications for this is the first treatment we do is ketogenic diet so ketogenic diet is a specialized diet that we use to treat epilepsy uh, that uh, treatment with the ketogenic diet is composed of increasing the fat a lot and then decreasing the carbohydrates, which will induce a state of starvation to the body, and then that will make ketones. Ketones are like beta-hydroxybutyrate. Those are uh, compounds that will increase the acidity in the blood, and that will treat seizures very effectively. And in cases of the first medication of seizures does not work, then we go to the second medication. If the second medication does not work, the chances of any other medication, third or any fourth medication will be between one to 5%, very, very low risk, uh, very low chances of, of controlling the seizures. So with this, we always look for alternative treatments. And then ketogenic diet is one of the successful treatments for drug resistant epilepsy. The chances of it helping people and stopping the seizures is about 40%, which is really a good chance when you compare it with 1% to 5% in the other treatments available with just medications. So ketogenic diet is a good treatment for epilepsy. You need it to be under medical supervision. So we need it to be under the neurologist supervision. We need to do a testing before and is followed by a nutrition or dietitian that is uh, specialized in ketogenic diet so that they can weigh the ratios and the, the exact amount of ketones and fats and all of that. And we need to follow up with medication with adjustment of, of all the ratios until we reach the perfect ratio, which makes the ketones. The other thing is with ketogenic diet, um, we have not everyone can take the ketogenic diet because there are some cases we they have some genetic tendencies and some metabolic abnormalities that they could not get ketogenic diet because that affects them, especially if it's in the mitochondria and the liver. So that's why we need it to be done under medical supervision so that we can give you the best out, out, outcome and it be safe. Some common side effects for the ketogenic diet is for patients who can have like stomach upset because it's a kind of heavy medication on the stomach. So they will have uh, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. Uh, they can develop kidney stones because of the change in the acidity will can precipitate some uh, stones in the kidneys. It can cause a headache and, and fatigue and decreasing in the growth and some hormonal abnormalities. So it is not like 100% safe, but it is very, very effective. And if it is the right thing for you. For children, we do ketogenic diet a lot. And I have lots of successful cases on ketogenic diet. 
And then for adults, uh, usually they are more like because we feed children, so it's easier. But when, in adults, we they have like lots of uh, you know like uh, compliance issues, and then the, the current diet is always full of calories and carbohydrates. So we have modification to the diet, like modified Atkins diet, low glycemic index diet, and medium uh, chain triglyceride all diet. All of those are variations of the ketogenic diet that can be very helpful in treating epilepsy and and seizures. So ask your doctor if you you are a, a good candidate for the ketogenic diet because it can make a lot of difference in your treatment of epilepsy. And the most important thing is that there is no cheating days in ketogenic diet. I know like people who are on keto or starvation or fasting or something, they can like have cheating days and change their diet. That could not, that should not happen in epilepsy. In epilepsy, if you are on ketogenic diet, you should be strictly on ketogenic diet, not get out of ketosis at all because any moment you get out of ketosis, like one bite of popcorn or something like chocolate for the kid, that can put them into ketosis and that can be the dangerous and induced seizures. The second recent advancement in epilepsy treatment this year is the epilepsy surgery. So there is a huge advancement in epilepsy by treating epilepsy surgery. Epilepsy surgery is that we, when we evaluate patients with drug-resistant epilepsy, they often have a scar in their brain or areas that are, uh, is causing the seizures to happen, malformations, a tumor, or a stroke. Or, like there is a spot in the brain that causes the seizures to happen, especially in cases of generalized epilepsy. And that is a case of uh, it can be treated surgically. Remember, the chances of epilepsy being stopped and, and cured and, and treated and, and improved with medications after failing two uh, appropriate anti-seizure medications is only about 5 or 1%. So there's very, very low chances. So that's why when we always ask about surgical treatment, the first step to do surgical treatment is to do epilepsy monitoring unit. We do a video EEG and best to be done under epilepsy center supervision. So uh, your epilepsy doctor is uh, kind of specialized in epilepsy and can do that. So they will get testing of, of the EEG in the brain. So they will be EEG of the brain and with video to prove that you have epilepsy and not non-epileptic seizures because psychogenic non-epileptic seizures happen about 30% of the time in those cases. And that is completely treatment di treated differently that I explained in the psychogenic non-epileptic seizure uh, case. And so this is number one. And then the second thing we do test a brain MRI, PET scan, MEG, all of those testing to kind of localize where the seizure activity is. If we can isolate seizure activity in one area of the brain and it is safe to resect that, then we can take it out surgically and cure the epilepsy, which is really good. So you can... You can treat seizures and epilepsy by doing some surgical treatment. And if it's like temporal lobe epilepsy, there is a clear scar in the brain and you take it out, the chances of curing epilepsy can be up to like 60 to 80%. And epilepsy surgery is generally safe. So what's new? The new thing in epilepsy surgery is uh, laser ablation. So laser ablation or laser surgery. Now it's at the forefront of, of seizure treatment and epilepsy. It's called LET, Laser Interstitial Thermal uh, Therapy. So this is a probe of laser probe that we put into the brain. And it's kind of very tiny. It's uh, the size of the, the, the pencil head. And that probe will go inside the brain and then it will uh, deliver a, a laser uh, treatment and that will uh, create some heat. And that heat will like be around this area and will do the surgery without opening the brain and the skull. So that is a huge thing because uh, because that makes a lot of difference in the treatment of epilepsy. Instead of opening the skull and doing this major surgery, now we can do it with with laser. Currently, we are testing this in, in clinical trials and we are understanding it more. So, so that's a great thing to do with uh, epilepsy surgery. So this is a great opportunity now for to get laser ablation as a treatment for epilepsy. Uh, so that's that, that's an important thing. So, if, if, uh, so now we're testing it more. It's available in the United States in the epilepsy centers, and it is being distributed other areas of the world, and we are testing it. I am part of a clinical trial to test that in measles timber sclerosis. One point about epilepsy surgery in laser, that laser will do the surgery, make it easier to happen and more safer, but it is not the, the, the ultimate treatment. You know, like any surgery can be done maybe like with open surgery and we do it with laser with less complications. But if you don't have laser available to you, that does not mean that you cannot do the surgery, but it might be with open surgery rather than this. So please let me know where are you watching us from so that we can uh, you know, uh, greet you. Uh, so... 
hello Juan. Uh, hello Juan Kelly, uh, Srihat, hello, how are you? Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, if you have any questions, please leave the leave them in the in the questions and I will answer them. Uh, Joanne Kelly, thanks so much for the super chat. Uh, so my neurosurgeon um, uh, said to me, my left temporal TBI with a scar uh, from a subdural hematoma 30 years ago, that is the, if the myoscar is more forward, Broca's area, it's easier than in the back of the brain, Wernicke's area. Uh, why is that? Because, so here's the thing, uh, when, when we are planning to do a surgical resection, we look where in the brain the seizures are coming from, because of that, we will design the surgery uh, and we prefer it to be not in a functional area it means that the area is not uh, where you talk from or you you move your arm so broca area is the front of the brain where you speak and the uh, wernicke area is when you uh, so, so it's all about the technique of the surgery and where it is from oregon oh all the way in the west coast colorado th thank you so much watching from sweden wow that's great so welcome all uh, scotland in the united states thank you so much dave and welcome everyone uh, so that's uh, that is great. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, so this is about laser ablation. The second uh, advancement in the treatment of epilepsy is uh, uh, vagus nerve stimulation. So vagus nerve stimulation or VNS, it's a it's a, a new relatively treatment for epilepsy by doing surgical treatment. And this is the the device. So the vagus nerve stimulation is a device that we implant in the neck. Uh, so the device will go itself under the clavicle, as you can see here, and then it will the uh, the, the clavicle and then the wire will go in the neck, and and then this will be and the clavicle the, and then the neck. So it will not be a brain surgery technically because it's outside the brain. Uh, however, it will be a, a uh, an effective treatment because the the wire this uh, vagus nerve will take the electricity up up to the brain, and that will make it more successful. So vagus nerve stimulation is a relatively uh, safe device. Uh, the success rate is good. The, the success rate of this device is about, uh, it will cut down the seizure by 50% and 50% of people. Chances of complete seizure freedom is about uh, five to 10% and it improves with time. And the best thing about vagus nerve stimulation is that we can implant it in people who have like seizures could not localize it well in the brain or the seizures are coming from multiple spots. So we cannot take it surgically or in generalized epilepsy. There are multiple uh, indications for that device. Almost everyone can get vagus nerve stimulation and it's a, pre a pretty safe device to implant so it's a good option and it is also in other areas of the world some areas in europe only have the dbs uh, vns and some areas in like india and africa and, and other areas they don't have access to the laser surgery or other advancements so they can use vns pretty well and that can be a good solution so ask your doctor if vns is a good choice for you so so that's vns and and it's an exciting thing so i use it and some people benefit of like by just decreasing the seizure frequency and also the experience improvement in the severity of the seizure so instead of having big shaking seizures and falling to the ground and being knocked out for a whole 24 hours i have patients who implanted the device they have a minor seizure and then they wake up right away which is really that they made a lot of difference instead of you know a mom she takes care of her for her girls and then instead of like staying 24 hours disabled she will just snap right away after five minutes that is a good a treatment option Another exciting treatment option for epilepsy is deep brain stimulation. So it's a new device for epilepsy and we can implant this device. So this is the deep brain stimulation device. And uh, so for this device, we implant the, the device into in, uh, in the chest. The battery will go into the chest, usually on the right side of the, of the chest. And then the wires will go deep inside the brain. And that is implanted inside the brain to give electricity in the brain to fight epilepsy and seizures. And then the way the way this happens is by looking uh, like by stimulating the brain, the electricity will go into the brain and it will start helping the seizures and neutralizing that seizure activity. It is a smart where we put this device. So the device is put in the thalamus. So the thalamus is the relay station of the brain. All the sensation will come to the thalamus and from the thalamus will go out to, to the brain and, and it's a connection. So I think of the thalamus, that deep area in the brain as the hub station, the downtown metro station, that all the trains will go there and then will leave downtown back and forth. And that's where the, the thalamus is. 
and we put strategically the wires there to give the stimulation so it will go throughout the brain and this works very well especially for the frontal lobe epilepsy temporal lobe epilepsy and now we even use it for generalized epilepsy. The device complication rate is very, very small, and it is very well tolerated, and it's very safe surgery, and we implant this device and, and start to program it. Usually the batteries for all of those devices will last between four and eight years, and some people are lucky and even like last longer. And if you have any questions about those devices, let me know in the, in the comments, and I will answer it. Uh, the comments on YouTube, okay? Uh, so here is uh, uh, here is this device, and uh, some complications of this device is that because it's in the thalamus where the connection between the emotion areas of the brain, the PIPT circuit, it can cause uh, people to have depression and mood disorders. So what we do is that we uh, do lower stimulation. That works very well. So it's a good solution for epilepsy treatment. And then the next exciting device is the responsive neurostimulation. So responsive neurostimulation is a great device that we use for epilepsy treatment. And this is a device that is implanted in the brain. So this is the device. So the device itself is a pretty small device that goes in the skull, implanted inside the skull, and it's under the skin hidden, no one will see it. And then there are wires that are threaded inside the brain, like as a, as a depth electrode or on top of the brain. And uh, those devices are smart. So there is a computer inside this device, and this computer will read the brain waves all the time. And once it sees a seizure, it will give a neutralizing uh, like shock. Like it kind of like gives a little electrical impulse to stop the seizure. And what I do with those devices is that I uh, look at the, the EEG activity and, and train the computer and the artificial intelligence inside the device to recognize those seizures and recognize those patterns. So the device will be very smart and will start to learn the patient's own seizures. And every time it sees a seizure, it will give us uh, an impulse. And also it will record the brain waves. So it is a great for monitoring. So lots of people, about 50%, they have no idea that they're having seizures or they will forget having seizures. So this device is actually recording their brain waves all the time. And once it sees a seizure, it will record it and we can uh, interrogate the device and see all of those seizure activities even remotely. And that is a good solution. Even when you give medications or any treatment, we will know. The chances of this device helping the seizures are between 50 to 70%. That's really good. It will drop the seizures significantly. And it can cause complete seizure freedom in about between uh, 10 and 20%. So this is a very good chances that it can help you. The best patients for this device is if there is focal epilepsy, either there are two spots in the brain that we cannot resect them, or it is happening in the functional area of the brain. Functional area means that's in an area of the brain that was where you speak from, where you talk, or you see, we cannot take it out surgically, then we will put this device to cure the seizures and stop them from happening. And that is a great uh, uh, treatment for epilepsy. This device now is only available in the United States. Um, so we should know that. It is not available in Canada, Europe, or anywhere else outside the United States. The, the company that makes the device, it has to sponsor it, and it is being studied outside the United States so that it can be authorized and, and uh, given in, the, in Europe, Australia, India, or other areas of the world. Uh, but hopefully it's coming soon. So we will, we will announce that once it is and we'll explain more information about this device once uh, we have more information and it's available. I myself like uh, works in a center that we tested the device since 2005, even years before it was in the, clin uh, in the market. We did clinical trials. We have very good experience over years and years. So it's, it's a great option. So because we're in the United States, we have patients from Canada uh, drive to the United States. They get this device, especially like Michigan, Detroit, where we have a good, uh, like a very close. So they come and they get the, this. And I have done many uh, surgeries for Canadian patients who come in across the, across the bridge and, and and treat in the United States. All right, so we have other uh, treatments as, as alternative medicine. Everyone is asked about supplements, herbs, alternative medications, uh, acupuncture, uh, chiropractor, whatever treatment that they can use to help treating seizures. So the problem with that is that at this point, we do not have any proven therapy outside those medications and surgical treatments for epilepsy, like acupuncture, all of that does not help seizures. And then the other thing, there are lots of herbs people use, remedies and, and so on, especially in other areas, uh, other cultures. And uh, the, the answer here is that having herbs for uh, like herbal treatments and artisanal treatments for uh, epilepsy can be dangerous in some cases because 
because being natural does not mean being safe, right? Like the best poisons came from mushrooms and from spiders and snakes. They are all natural, even organic, but that does not mean that's a safe thing for, for you to use. So, uh, you know, we have to be careful about using those. And now what we do, we study any compound in clinical trial. And once it is approved, then we can use it like medical marijuana. People were using and smoking marijuana for a long time. And once we did this clinical trials, we now have the CBD oil as a medication called Epidiolex. And this is the medication we prescribe. So we make sure that you get the same dose because epilepsy is a chronic condition, needs treatment for a long time. So we have to treat it for a long time and, and, and follow up with it. Other new advancement is the medication Sinobamate or Xcopy. Sinobamate is a new medication. I made a video explaining Sinobamate in details on my YouTube channel, so you can review that. However, in, in cases of Sinobamate, this medicine is very, very successful, much better than any other you know, seizure medication so far. It's a relatively new medication, so it has very good chances. I have good experience in my clinic. I have about like, you know, 25, 25 30 patients on Synovomate. All of them had significant improvement or even stopped having seizures altogether. And even we delayed and stopped surgery because of Synovomate. So it's a good medicine. It does have interactions and side effects. So you need like kind of a doctor who is really experienced in epilepsy treatment to, to deal with Synovomate. So I kind of, it does have interaction. It interacts with liver enzyme, makes other medications higher. So it does have inter liver interaction. So we have to decrease other medications like Onfi, Clobazam, Freesium. They, they increase a lot with Clobazam. Uh, Phenytoin, Dilantin increase a lot with, with that. And Bimpat or Lacosamide. All of those medications interact a lot with uh, medicine Synovomate. And the other thing, it does have allergic reaction, especially if the titration was quick. So we do it very slow to avoid allergic reactions. So that's an important consideration with the medication Synovomate. It's a good new treatment. We have other treatment options for uh, Synovomate. Uh, and then uh, other treatment option for epilepsy other than Synovomate, we have uh, Fenfluramine. This is uh, Fintabla, its name, and, uh, and other medications that we use uh, for especially for Drabe syndrome and for Lenox Castor syndrome. Those are new treatments and uh and, and, and then that's it. So, so those are medications that we can use. And some people say like, oh, I have Neuropace and VNS. Yes, we can combine multiple devices at the same time. So they can sometimes even help each other. All right, now the golden moment. I, I will answer all your questions about epilepsy. Write them in the comments and I will answer them. I am uh, uh, answering all your, your questions. Watching from Germany. Hey, how are you? Uh, welcome from Germany. Do, uh, so the, the first question is that... Uh, I'm interested about hearing this and I have generalized epilepsy and I have tonic clonic uh, seizures. I'm afraid uh, to miss the, any, uh, any medications. Yes, when you have gen generalized epilepsy and generalized tonic clonic seizures, it is very important not to miss any medications because missing medications can be dangerous and it can cause people to have some complications. So definitely be consistent with your medication because it does uh, have uh, a consequence if you don't take it on time. Uh, I have epilepsy uh, from traumatic brain injury at the age of three years is uh, curable permanently. So very important, the concept of cure. Cure is only with like infectious diseases and like very small amount of disease in medicine that we have cure for. So epilepsy is a chronic condition. Uh, like for cases of a strep throat, you have a virus or bacteria, and then you give antibiotic for the bacteria, the bacteria dies, this is a cure. But for epilepsy, uh, it's a chronic condition, especially if the cause was a scar in the brain. The scar is permanent in the brain, so there is no cure completely. However, medications do stop the seizure and that will be a cure, if you would say, under treatment. So like diabetes and hypertension, this is a chronic condition that we always have, but medications are supposed to help and, and also surgeries will help a lot. Uh, if treated by a VA employed neurologist, they do not have excopri prescribed for us vet veterans. However, if you have a uh, vet visit uh, VA community care, a neurologist prescribes uh, excopri. Well, um, thank you for your service, sir. And then uh, for, uh, for you know, we are looking at hopefully the excopri synovomate will be on uh, on the prescription for all the hospitals around the world. Sometimes it takes time for insurance companies, for governments to ac adopt this new treatment, but it eventually will will be available everywhere. And our job is to kind of get a very good experience out in the world. And then so that every neurologist will be able to use it and prescribe it. Uh, what do you think about Synovomate? Yes, I, I answered this. It's a, it's a good medication. I, I, I advise you to go and see the Synovomate video I made on my YouTube channel. That will be a helpful thing to do. 
Um, I had a surgery on my left uh, temporal lobe. I had scarring removed. Haven't had seizures for three years now. Oh my God! Thank you, thank you, Joanne, for uh, for uh, sharing your uh, experience. That's a great achievement. Uh, see, this is the beauty of of uh, epilepsy surgery. When you have uh, a scar in the brain, temporal sclerosis, or any like malformation in the cells, then we identify that. And medications will not work for this condition. Medications usually work in only 1% of the, of the people. So we do a surgery, we take out that temporal lobe, and then seizures will stop completely in about 60 to 80%. That's a great and a huge, uh, and congratulations, Joanne, on this. All right, more question. Uh, do epilepsy uh, machines reduce memory power? Um, the question is that uh, can those devices implanted for epilepsy decrease the memory and affect the memory? Most of them no, the, uh, at all. Like most of them do not affect the memory. If at all, it will improve memory. So because uh, you can review the video about memory and epilepsy, I made in details about this condition and memory. But however, if we have uncontrolled seizures, the spikes and the seizures, they will disturb the memory and damage the memory areas of the brain, the hippocampus, and then you will have memory loss. The devices will decrease the the seizures. And that will help with memory. And then especially the uh, responsive neurostimulation, RNS, when it is implanted in the brain, it will help a lot with, uh, with the memory and that will, will improve the memory and has been studied and proven that it will be helpful for the uh, uh, memory. Uh, Joanne, thank you so much for the super chat. And uh, okay, so mo more questions. Uh, okay, so my scar tissue is causing my seizures. I have failed four different types of medication. I'm excited to see the seizure surgeon. Yes. Uh, next, hopefully I'm watching laser ablation for uh, here in Arizona. Yes, that's a great, uh, uh, that's a great ex ex excitement. So if anyone fails medications i will say medications failed you you did not fail them <laughs> medications fail to control your seizures so if medications fail to control your seizures then you have medica uh, drug resistant epilepsy four medications is a lot of medications if you add any more medications unlikely that it will cause any significant change in your seizures then you have to go to the surgical treatment surgical treatment needs to be done under epilepsy su surgery i know that there are excellent uh, epilepsy surgery centers in arizona so you can see that and hopefully they will tell you if what is the best device for you? I am from India. Welcome. Uh, I take uh, multiple medications. Uh, ha I'm having seizures uh, for the last uh, 30 years. I'm having nighttime seizures. Am I going? Uh, <clears throat> am I doing right way? So <clears throat> we know that in cases of drug resistant epilepsy, it means that you have seizures despite being on multiple medications. Then the seizures, yes, they will they will continue with medications, and then you need to look into some surgical treatment. And surgical treatment needs to be evaluated by an epilepsy surgery uh, program and epilepsy surgery center and uh, see if that is uh, an option for you. Dr. Danun, you have thoughts, uh, uh, taught me uh, so much about uh, seizures. My doctor is always surprised with all the information I know whenever I, I go from my visit. <laughs> That's right, uh, Mr. Ramirez. So it's, uh, this is my mission, is to educate every patient about their epilepsy so that they would be so confident in their condition and take good care of themselves and their loved ones. And uh, yes, the, the goal is to give you all the recent updates that might your neurologist not even heard about them because they're, man, like learning about epilepsy and keeping up with the new treatments and advances, like drinking from a fire hose. It is lots of information. That's why I spend my life and career treating and educating about epilepsy. And we just did the, the epilepsy conference in, in, uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, by the American Epilepsy Society, all the new advancements, five days from, from seven o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night, nonstop treatments and, and advancement and research about epilepsy. And I was teaching other people about EEG. So it's, it was great experience. Yes, uh, I want you to take all this information, look very smart in front of your neurologist and take good care of yourself and your family. From uh, yeah, excellent. Uh, what can <clears throat> what can I uh, do so that I might not forget what I uh, have studied? Uh, yes, this is like a problem with memory loss and epilepsy. People with with the memory loss, they can have issues with memory and remembering things. So um, there are techniques that you can use to kind of remembering, listing things, repeating, and make sure that your seizures are under good control. And you're not on medication that can worsen the memory, such as topiramate, topamax. It to be a can worsen the memory a lot, and it's we call it doba max <laughs> from like how much memory loss it can cause. Uh, my question is about uh, my dog. 
I have a dog developed myoclonus, myoclonus after uh, uh, this timber. There are involuntary muscle contraction. There is uh, a cure for myoclonus. I was using Lyrica. Well, that's an interesting question. First, I'm not a veterinary. I'm a human doctor. <laughs> uh, however, we have dogs having epilepsy. And dogs, like any other species, they can have epilepsy. Interestingly, when I was trained at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, we had a lab to study epilepsy. In our lab, we had dogs. They have seizures, and we implanted them with devices like the deep brain stimulation device and other devices. And we studied their epilepsy and seizures, and we learned lots about treatments and, and uh, changes and variations in epilepsy just from those dogs. So dogs can be a great uh, test for epilepsy and research. What kind of a positive or negative effect does uh, this drug have on myoclonus? Zunisamide uh, said that positive effect on myoclonus. Should I change the drug? Uh, well, I, I, I cannot. I cannot have. We know that in humans, I'm not talking dog, dogs. You have to ask your veterinarian. In humans, the myoclonus can be from the generalized epilepsy, and the treatment with uh, with myoclonus is generalized epilepsy medication like uh, like uh, levetiracetam or Kebra, uh, Debacode, valbric acid, and other medication. I explain in details in the video about generalized epilepsy you can review. I was seizure free for 10 years while only taking Lamictal. After getting COVID, my seizures are not getting controlled. Now I'm on Lamictal, Oscar Bazbin, and Rivet. Wow. Um, well, that is an interesting finding that we have noticed that pe uh, people with uh, COVID-19, the seizures can get worse or even they start having epilepsy out because of that. I did study COVID-19 and seizures at the beginning of the pandemic. I formed a research coalition to study this because no one went to school for COVID-19. So I studied myself. I have a post-COVID clinic for all the complications. We have found that people can have de developing epilepsy uh, newly and they can worsen their existing epilepsy and seizures. So yeah, Yes, it can be uh, the case that uh, COVID made it worse. Would it better to get lit uh, surgery or RNS? What is cheaper? <laughs> well, here's the thing about, about the, the cost of the surgery. First of all, like no one ever can uh, uh, estimate the cost of epilepsy surgery or epilepsy treatment because there is so much individualization and every case is different and every hospital have the different techniques and, and doing things. So it is different uh, be case by case. With what is the best for you, this will be decided after doing the whole epilepsy evaluation that I recommended and I talked about. So your doctors will be at the end able to decide, are you a surgical resection candidate, like taking out the brain area by surgery or laser? or are you a stimulation candidate means that we implant those devices to stimulate the brain and lots of factor play here and that's why we need an epilepsy specialized center to decide laser surgery yes it is expensive laser ablation is expensive and it is not available worldwide but it is it is coming for uh, soon hopefully My TBI uh, scar in the brain. Yes, the TBI can leave scars in the brain. Does demyelination cause seizures? Uh, there is evidence now from research showing that demyelination, like multiple sclerosis, increases the risk of seizures. And epilepsy can have a little bit increased risk of demyelinating disease. Yes. So uh, demyelination, especially multiple sclerosis, can a little bit increase the risk of seizures. I was uh, seizure-free for 10 years. Yes, covid uh, yeah, we got that question. How do I know if I if I have anxiety with uh, non-epileptic seizures, PNES, uh, or real epilepsy? Okay, so uh, how do I know if I have anxiety with PNES or real epilepsy? So first of all, uh, we call this like epilepsy is a is a the epilepsy epileptic seizures, and there is and this is seen on EEG and, and and MRI. You do MRI, you see a scar in the brain or see like some evidence of that, or it can be normal. And do EEG and you will find the spikes of the brain. And the non-epileptic seizures, it's not anxiety. It's completely different than anxiety. I highly recommend you see the non-epileptic seizure PNES series. It has comprehensive review of all everything you need to know about PNES. I did it for like four, five months straight preparation and interviews. So it's a great video that you will benefit from. So review this, that series. The way to tell the difference between non-epileptic seizure, PNES, and epileptic seizures, they're all both real, by the way, is to do epilepsy monitoring unit, the evaluation in the of the brain uh, by doing EEG and record the event and see the brain waves. If it was epilepsy, you will see a brainstorm and electricity storm in the brain. If it was non-epileptic seizures, then we will not see those changes in the brain. It will be non-epileptic seizure. 
Thank you for the info. My daughter has GAD 65 autoimmune encephalitis and epilepsy. She is refractory with 3000 milligram uh, of levetiracetam and lamotrigine currently. She is on solumidrol uh, infection. Yeah, infusion. Yes, so this is a special type of epilepsy called autoimmune epilepsy. Uh, GAD uh, is one of the anti, uh, antibodies that, uh, anti-GAD antibody is one of the antibodies that can cause seizures. It will cause seizures, it will cause behavioral changes, maybe psychotic disorder in some patients. It will cause, um, uh, some cases, diabetes because GAD, GAD can cause seizures and cause, uh, affects the pancreas and cause diabetes. So all of those are possibilities. The treatment is different. We can do medications and then immune modulation. So infusion of solumidrol and other treatments like the immune modulation therapies like uh, uh, silcept, uh, mycophenolate, mofetil, uh, azithioprine, uh, all of those are some treatments, rituximab in some cases, all depends on the case. So highly recommend to kind of see an epilepsy specialized neurologist. We can implant devices and do surgical treatments for those cases, but mostly it is multiple areas. So we cannot resect the brain, but we can uh, stimulate the brain. My, uh, cause, can surgery cause memory problems because I'm a student, because doctors team have advice for surgery or multiple medications? Please, guys. Uh, yes, that's an excellent question. Will surgical treatment cause memory loss? Uh, the answer is it depends a lot where the surgery is and the extent of the surgery. Uh, there are memory areas, yes, in the temporal lobe, especially in the temporal lobe. And if it is a temporal lobe epilepsy, we can test the memory. If there is a scar from before, especially the scar started early in life, that will be area already having a scar. So taking it out will not be having lots of memory issues. But if it was a fresh brain and you take it out, yes, there will be a chances in temporal lobe epilepsy. In a frontal lobe epilepsy, it might not cause issues in memory or in occipital lobe. So it depends a lot on the surgery. Only resection surgery. If we implant devices, there will not be any memory issues. If any, it will improve the memory. It's always a balance between like what are you going to have surgery for and what is the complications versus benefit. If COVID has caused cytokine inflammation in the brain, it causes seizures. Uh, how can we lower that down? So, well, it's all a theories of COVID causing inflammation in the brain and cytokines. Usually it's a one monophasic event, means it happens one time. It's not ongoing damage. So that that is kind of like a hurricane hit your neighborhood. There will be branches and debris, but the water is gone, but we're dealing with the aftermath, if you would say. So that is, that's maybe like how COVID affects the brain. Usually the inflammation will decrease over time and hopefully the seizures will come back, uh, will come back to be controlled again with time. But if it's not co controlled for a year or two, ask your neurologist, maybe you need some surgical treatment or devices because you cannot just keep having seizures. That's bad. You can hit yourself and have complication. Uh, uh, what is the best and highly effective supplements for epilepsy? Uh, so here's the thing. At this point, there is no supplement treatment for epilepsy. There is no uh, medication the supplement or anything that can cure epilepsy or seizures. Any treatment that we need to do for epilepsy has to go through clinical trials to make sure it is safe, it is effective, what is the dose and what is the treatment so that we can recommend it. But at this one, we don't have any supplements for epilepsy. Does Lamictal will help uh, with depression from non-bipolar uh, patient? Uh, bipolar disorder. Yes, Lamictal Lamotrigine is a good medication for seizures and it can help with mood. So it is a mood stabilizer. So yes, it can help your mood if you have uh, Lam uh, if you take Lamictal. But always ask for your doctor. Uh, excellent question. For someone with ADHD and can who cannot take amphetamines for treatment since it causes interactions with anti-seizure medication, how can uh, come up with ADHD? First of all, amphetamines, Ritalin, all of those uh, stimulants for ADHD are safe in epilepsy. So you should know that. Like amphetamine is safe in epilepsy and you can use that and it does not increase the seizures. Yes, it's a stimulant, but only in like excessive doses where people use it for drugs that can cause uh, seizures to happen. But in regular treatment doses, it does not cause that. And it, uh, we have studies and a recent meta-analysis by Dr. Worrell from the Mayo Clinic, who was my mentor, and she discovered that all the, those medications are safe in epilepsy, so you can use that and ask your doctor, there's always, you know, like, if, why they, they say that it does not happen.
Does fa uh, focal seizures hurt the brain? Some as tonic clonic uh, uh, does. So here's the thing. Most of the seizures do not cause brain damage uh, specifically unless they are long seizures, means lasting for the more than five minutes. That will kind of burn through the brain and causes uh, damage. And this is called status epilepticus and needs medical treatment and it's a medical emergency. So yes, seizures can cause damage to the brain if they are repetitive or if they are long. Shorter seizures might not. We worry about falls and injuries and accidents and burns more than the damage to the brain, but it, it can be uh, hurt. Uh, please uh, give topic for infantile spasm. Yes, infantile spasm is a very, very important topic in epilepsy and seizures. And I did a video to explain infantile spasms from, from A to Z. Everything about infantile spasm is explained in my video. So you can go back to my channel and, and review the infantile spasm video. But for, for here, infantile spasm is a specific seizure that happens in little children, usually a few months old or even newborns. And they will have like sh sh like tensing up, the, the, the eyes will go one side and they will tense up like this. It keeps happening a lot. And if and it can be caused by genetic disorders, can be caused by brain malformation, stroke for uh, prenatally, hypoxia, multiple causes that can cause this. And this is very very important to capture it early on because if you do not capture it correctly and diagnose it right, then that can be irreversible damage to the brain. So it's emergency to to, to treat that very quickly. There are specific medications for infantile spasm, like uh, uh, Vigabatrin, Sabril, and uh, other medication, ACTH and prednisone. Those are the three medications that for uh, infantile spasm, it is essential to make the diagnosis. Lots of people are like, oh, the patient has, uh, the baby has a reflux, they have colic, all of that, and they are seizures. So it's very important. Look at the videos for instant infantile spasm in my video, and you can, you can see if that is what your child has. And in case of infantile spasm, if it's combined with developmental delay and uh, combined with abnormal EEG, if, if it's combined, then it's called uh, West syndrome. And this is the syndrome that can be uh, treated, uh, by the, but can be severe epilepsy. Which supplement is helpful to cover from side effects uh, of anti-seizure medication uh, vegetarian patients? Uh, we don't have supplements for anti-seizure medications specifically. Uh, only in cases of debacote valproic acid, they can take uh, like uh, they can take supplements to protect the liver, uh, and those are might be helpful for vegetarian patients to make sure that you are if it's sufficient on some trace elements and vitamins. So taking multivitamin can be can be helpful. And discuss with the neurologist what is the best supplement for you. So uh, how to keep your brain uh, active since anti-seizure medication slows down your brain like having cognitive side effects? Yes, it can have uh, cognitive side effects can happen with, uh, with the brain uh, from seizures themselves or from anti-seizure medications. Keep you, yourself engaged. Exercise is essentially important. It's very, very helpful to exercise. Keep a, a, a exercise routine. That's very important. And also get out and puzzles, reading, all of that can be helpful. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, thank you so much for having it. Uh, thoughts on vi uh, vitamin B6 for seizures in adult. Uh, so vitamin B6, um, there's only cases of vitamin B6 pyridoxin deficiency in children. We give that as a supplement and that is very helpful. But this is a genetic cause and it's only extreme rare cases. Uh, in general, vitamin B6 does not help epilepsy or seizures. And also Vitamin B6, if it was given for a long time, it can cause neuropathy and issues in the in the nerves. So see, like anything in excess is bad. So don't take it like really like without any any control. Can an epileptic patient uh, take uh, no uh, nootropics? I know what that is. So if you have like the brand name, the the brand name, uh, that'll be uh, you know the scientific name of the medication, so they can see it. Thank you very much. Uh, guidance from India. Thank you so much for joining us from India. Any thought on omega-3 supplement for seizures? Does not help seizures. Low evidence on any memory. Uh, how many hours an epileptic patient should sleep? Excellent question. We know that sleep deprivation can cause seizures to happen. And uh, sleep deprivation can be like bad on, on memory. And also for patients who have sleep apnea, they snore at night, they wake up tired, they have obesity, large neck, all of those are risk factors for sleep apnea. So it's uh, it's recommended to sleep. How much sleep? It depends a lot on the age. So make sure that you like consult with your doctor what is your specific, but mostly for adults uh, like us, you need to sleep between uh, seven to eight hours. That would be a good and uh, continuous night sleep, not fragmented sleep here and there. Okay, and avoid alcohol at all. All right, Joanne uh, Kelly, thank you so, uh, uh, John Kelly, thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, what determines a perfect candidate for surgery? Excellent question. Uh, 
perfect candidate for surgery is somebody who has uh, uh, like a good candidate for surgery will be if somebody has a scar in the brain or any malformation, we call it legional epilepsy it means that there is a scar in the brain there is a legion that we can attack or tackle uh, surgically so legional epilepsy legional case and temporal lobe hopefully it is on the right temporal lobe the left temporal lobe that's where the language and memory is right temporal lobe is much safer to resect so if the best candidate for surgery that i pray i get all the time for patients so that because i will help them the most is that somebody has temporal lobe epilepsy mesial temporal sclerosis there is a scar in the brain that is in the right side Perfect. This is a perfect candidate. We can do laser ablation or we can do temporal lobectomy and seizures will stop in about 60 to 80 percent. This is the perfect surgery candidate, but they don't come a lot, unfortunately. Whenever I exercise like push-ups, etc., I have auras. Any thoughts on this? So if somebody pushes themselves to the limit, like uh, like physical stress or psychological stress, seizures can happen. Aura is a seizure. It's a seizure. Aura is a seizure, but it's a small and it keeps the awareness. So people say like, oh, I only have auras. I don't have seizures. No, that's wrong. like auras are seizures, but they're small and did not get uh, bigger. So if you exercise, just make sure that you get enough balanced exercise and eat, eat enough, and that hopefully will improve. Maybe that, that you need better treatment for your seizure. How to deal with Kibra rage? Oh, Kibra is levetiracetam, and this is a medicine that is good for epilepsy and is widely available in use. However, it can cause lots of rage, psychiatric side effects. Uh, it's bad. <laughs> like when, if I myself do not start any Kibra in any patient with psychiatric history. So I will ask them, do you have anger issues, psychiatric, depression, anxiety? If the, if the answer is yes, you should not start Kibra or avoid it, uh, and then you should stop it and replace it. So uh, I'm not giving you medical advice, but we know in general that there are medications that cause um, uh, side effects of psychiatric like Kibra and Pirampanil, Ficompa. And medications that are happy medications, they, they reverse that, like lamotrigine, lamictal, and depakote, valproic acid, and carbamazepine. Those are the happy medications. They can fight that side effect. So ask your doctor about that. There are some evidence about uh, pyridoxine, vitamin B6, to help with that, but um, I did not see it very helpful in, in, in adults. I learned so much from your videos and my epilepsy hero. Oh, Jeff, thank you so much, Jeffrey, uh, for your uh, support. Uh, definitely, I appreciate your presence and everyone presence here because that's my mission is to educate everyone about their epilepsy. So that will be 100% confident and knowledgeable so that they can even take those treatments to their doctors and, and help themselves and their loved one. Uh, 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 new, uh, so, okay, so new, uh, new topics is a supplement that has uh, caffeine, paracetam, modafinil, etc. I'm not sure I would recommend that. It has some stimulant, so you should be worried because caffeine, modafinil can be a stimulant and it might affect your sleep. I don't think it can affect uh, help the memory. Still no working medicine, but on the way, I hope, yes. So here's the thing. We know that if you, if you, your seizures ha are not controlled by two medications that are appropriately chosen, appropriately uh, uh, given for enough time, enough dose, then you have drug rest and epilepsy. And this will not improve with medication. A any more medication, the chances between one to 5% or even less. So just keep uh, trying medications is not gonna help. What you need to do is you need to go to the epilepsy center come to see me or other epilepsy center colleagues. And then we will do the formal evaluation and see if you have epilepsy first or non-epileptic seizures, what kind of epilepsy you have, where is that seizure coming from so that we can better uh, treat. I use multivitamins and omega-3. Is it sufficient? Calcium supplement. We, we recommend calcium vitamin D for epilepsy to kind of just protect the bones, but omega-3 and other ones might, you know, you can use it if you want, but I don't think it harm, it's harmful, but might not help a lot. My son did not have seizure for 16 years and suddenly he had a huge status event and nearly died. Oh my God, he had COVID. I'm so sorry to hear that, uh, Susie. And uh, yes, we know that status epilepticus can happen in people with epilepsy and it can be the first presentation as a status epilepticus. And this is because like, you know, sometimes the seizure latch on and never go away. The brain was not able to su suppress it and uh, an infection can precipitate status epilepticus. I got hypothalamus hamartoma. Excellent. Hypothalamus hamartoma is a very unique diagnosis of epilepsy. It is deep inside the brain and the hypothalamus deep, deep, deep inside the brain. And now 
We do surgical treatments for hypothalamic hamartoma. I have success with hypothalamic hamartoma being treated by laser. So instead of, because it's so deep, you cannot like open the skull and, open, and, and do it. So the two treatments now is either do a laser ablation, like putting the, the laser wire all the way deep in the brain and, and, and ablate that hamartoma, or we can do transnasal surgery, like open uh, through the nose, open the sinuses and go into the brain and take out that hamartoma. So look, we need an epilepsy center that is uh, effective for treatment because this is a, you know, can be complicated surgery. I mean, it's, it's not complicated, but like a planning, is it? Being a software developer who uses laptop and focus on the laptop a lot, is that safe for epileptic patients? Laptops, computers, screens are not causing seizures. They don't cause seizures and epilepsy. But however, if you are like work long hours, the exhaustion and tiredness, that is what causes the seizure. Uh, in which case uh, would you still use phenobarbital? So phenobarbital now is not widely used. We try to avoid it at all costs because it has lots of side effects. It is an older medication. It interacts with the liver. It, it interacts with other medication. It can cause bone loss on the long term. So lots of side effects. And it causes dependence means that you have to increase the dose. And it has very bad withdrawals if it stopped suddenly. So we don't use phenobarbital. I do not use start it on any medication to be on, to any patient to be honest. Now, only patients like old patients who are on phenobarbital barbital we continue it but i never started on my on any patient only like in some children neonates they use phenobarbital for their like neonatal seizures and it can be helpful Benzodiazepines for focal and tonic-clonic seizures, long-term treatment. Benzodiazepines um, are mostly like for short-term seizure treatment. There is only one benzodiazepine that can be used for given for long-term treatment, which is the clobazam, freesium or onfi, and that this is uh, an anti-seizure medication. Does anti-epileptic uh, rescue uh, reduce hemoglobin, calcium levels? Um, some anti-epileptic medication like valproic acid, debacote, and uh, carbamazepine, tigritol, dilantin, phenytoin, all of those can cause bone marrow suppression and decrease the, the blood. But we have to see a, a blood doctor to make sure that this is not something that we need to worry about, like, you know, other causes. My epilepsy have progressed, and now I have been dealing with new seizure types and thought paralysis. Anything important patient needs to know about thought paralysis? First of all, seizures, if they are left untreated or with time, they can get worse. Yes, it can happen, uh, especially if an untreated seizures or seizure drug resistant. That's why we need to treat seizures with, with surgical treatment so that do not get worse. And, and that's a major complication of seizures, and that can cause some brain damage as well. Uh, is there any p uh, patient thought paralysis? So thought paralysis is weakness after the seizure, and especially if patient has a scar in their brain or stroke or anything in that brain, that can cause the seizures, uh, the thought paralysis. There's no specific treatment for thoughts. It will just reverse on its own. Uh, how many medications can we take at uh, at a time if the surgery is not a choice? Well, I mean, it depends on the case. I aim for maximum of three medications, but there are some cases that need more. But I aim for a three medication maximum. Uh, uh, John Kelly, thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, x -Cobra is a great new option uh, rather than surgery. Well, here's the thing. It's all about the patient and what they have and how the treatment is success. You know, it, it, it's not a bad idea to try x sonobamid before going to the surgery. What I do myself with my patients, I will do both in parallel. I will start x sonobamid and I will continue working up for their, them for surgery. So if the medicine fails to, to control the seizure, it can happen. Like, you know, half of the cases or even more, they do not get a response with this medicine. Uh, then we, we're ready to do the surgery. But I will do both in parallel. Uh, my scar tissue is in the front side of my brain. Can I still get laser surgery? Um, yeah, so tra traumatic brain injury usually happens in the front of the brain and in the timber lobe and sometimes in the occipital. This is how the mechanics of the trauma is. Like you hit your head, then those are areas are like if somebody was shot or fell down or something, wherever like the cause of the trauma, then there is a scar and uh, it depends. So if there is a scar in the brain, we have to prove that the seizures are coming from the scar and what area in the scar and then plan accordingly. Sometimes we clean the scar out by surgical treatment. Sometimes we do laser. It all depends on the case. That's why you need the epilepsy center to see you. Do people get used to uh, side effects of anti-seizure medications as the time goes by? Uh, that's correct. Yes, anti-seizure medications usually have the most side effects at the beginning of the of the time and then once we advance in the treatment yes the side effects will improve uh, uh, and and that is uh, an option that you know like seizure is yeah side effects will improve usually with time 
Is Kibra and uh, Lamotrigine safe together? Yes, Kibra and Lamotrigine can be given uh, to, together. All right, so how does uh, uh, epilepsy get worse uh, by age, even uh, maintained with medication? Dose? It's not like an absolute thing that epilepsy gets worse with age. It can get worse in some patients, especially if they are not controlled with medication. Does side effects get worse as long as you take the medications? Well, uh, usually the side effects, if any, they will improve with time as you take the medications. Uh, thanks for the uh, for the answers. Really would like uh, to tell people who smoke just tobacco, please quit smoking and really affect my epilepsy. Yes, smoking can affect the epilepsy and, and exacerbate. Uh, so don't smoke and don't uh, smoke with, you know, don't, don't expose others to smoke. All right. Uh, uh, th that's very very important and and then so for for all the, the uh, for all the devices that you need to know about epilepsy there are those specific devices I explain them in details and what they what they are and I show the device and show all the complications and the risk and benefit from those uh, devices you can uh, see it in this video about all the devices about epilepsy and stay healthy and see you in the next one.